Isn't it wonderful what's going on up at Lake Placid this week? Let's continue to pray for our missionaries and the good work that they're doing up there. Uh, a thousand pancakes. Wow. We're having a men's breakfast this coming Saturday, and we will will not be making a thousand pancakes. Now, I know some of you coming could probably eat that much, but uh, listen, this is a great opportunity for our men and, and wives, girlfriends. Listen, send your husband and boyfriend to the men's breakfast. Uh, and tell them to bring a friend because it's a great time of fellowship and the food is actually really good. I know because I helped prepare it. Uh, well, also, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we have a prayer call. Uh, Gary Apple set that up about a year and a half ago. It is going phenomenal. Uh, it is amazing, incredible encouragement uh, to every man on that call. Uh, and I know the ladies are probably saying, men's breakfast, men's prayer call, what are you doing, Pastor? Ladies, you all are very spiritual. And we have a wonderful women's ministry here, and they're doing a great job, and they do it without being prompted. Sometimes us men need a little prompting. So, gentlemen, for those of you who get up early, get on the prayer call. If you don't get up early, start getting up early and join our prayer call, because it will be a blessing to you. And how many of you look at the slides when they're up? I don't mean the songs. I mean the, the pre-service slides. So you are all aware that next Sunday at the 11 o'clock hour, the Sunday school hour, there's a new class called Christians in Action. It's a discipleship class, and it's going to be pastor-led. That does not mean that I am the only one doing it. That means that Richard and Adam, and maybe we can even haul Mitch in there on occasion, but uh, we're all going to be facilitating a class, and it is a discipleship class. It is designed to put feet to your faith. So it's not just simply an, an informational class. We're hoping it's going to be a transformational class. All right, that's enough of those announcements. So if you have your copy of God's Word, I'd invite you to open up to Galatians chapter 4. It's on page 974 of your Black Pew Bible. And if you don't have a Bible, that Black Pew Bible is now your Bible. We simply ask that you read it and obey it. <clears throat> now imagine writing your first book at the age of 22 and watching it land on bestsellers lists everywhere. That's what happened to an American pastor several years ago, a guy by the name of Joshua Harris. He wrote a book entitled, I've Kissed Dating Goodbye, and it, con it conveyed biblical advice about love and relationships, and it encouraged thousands of young people to make better choices, godly choices. Now, Harris became known for his speaking and his writing and his counseling, as well as nearly two decades of being a pastor at a local church. And yet somehow, during those years, his own relationship with God had evaporated. In 2019, he announced that he and his wife were going to get a divorce. And then in a follow-up post on Instagram, he disclosed an even deeper divorce. He said this, quote, I have undergone a massive shift in regard to my faith in Jesus. The popular phrase for this is deconstruction. The biblical phrase is falling away. By all the measurements that I have for defining a Christian, I am not a Christian, end quote. Now that probably touches some of you in a, in a way. It, as a pastor, it cuts me to my heart. Uh, because this is happening to more and more pastors and Christians all over the world, more than I've ever actually ever seen in my lifetime. People are falling away from the gospel of Jesus Christ and from Christ himself. I recently read an op-ed that had the title, Everyone is Leaving Christianity and Nobody Knows Where They're Going. Uh, this departure from biblical faith is happening so often that a new word has even been coined. Uh, those who used to be known as evangelicals are now called ex-evangelicals. Uh, and it's, it's a disturbing trend. But listen, this is not a new phenomenon. Even the early church uh, had dealt with people who took up the banner of Christ only to lay it down. That first generation uh, of, of Christian churches dealt with this. Now, we're continuing our study in this great book of Galatians. Uh, it's a sermon series entitled Amazing Grace. The Apostle Paul was a spiritual father to this Galatian church. And like any good father, he knew the church was in danger. Uh, apostate teachers, Judaizers, had come in, and they started corrupting the gospel of grace, that pure, beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ. And they were trying to replace it with a return to legalism. Now, undoubtedly, Paul wanted the church to not only reject their teachings, he wanted them to eradicate these people out of the church altogether. And today in our scripture, Paul's heartbreak reaches its absolute peak as he realizes that not only are the Judaizers perverting the gospel, but many inside of the church 
are following the false teaching. Paul loved them, and he realized that they were in the process of what we would call backsliding, falling away from the truth and replacing it with legalism. We are saved by grace alone, through our faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. And we can't do one single thing to add to our salvation, but yet that's what the Judaizers were trying to do. Paul wants to remind these Galatians of the God and the gospel that they are sliding away from. We'll be reading out of Galatians chapter 4. Uh, it's up on your screen. It's on page 974. And if you would, if you're able, I'd invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. Galatians chapter 4, beginning in verse 8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to once more be? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I have... For I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that, if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out, that you may make much of them. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose, and not only when I am present with you. My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, I wish I could be present with you and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this this tender and tearful scripture that we come to today, God. We see the Apostle Paul's heart aching for this church that he loves so much. You have set them free with the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel that tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, and yet, Lord, they were turning from it. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the truth of the gospel, and we thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. And I pray, God, that as we open up this word, that you would speak to us through the corridors of time and space, and that you would transform us and conform us more into the image of your blessed Son, Jesus. And it's in his precious name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. When we drift from Jesus, it is a gradual drift. As it was once said, you you, you do it slowly and then suddenly. Uh, You don't even realize that it's happening. And what what we learn here today is that there are three stages to backsliding we need to be aware of. The first is a stage of devotion. Now you say, well, if you're backsliding, you can't be devoted. Well, you've got to start somewhere because if you've never come to Jesus, you can't backslide. Uh, You can't leave what you haven't come to. And, and Paul is speaking with a pastor's heart. He loves these people, and his heart burns passionately with a righteous anger about those leading them away. First, he reminds them of their past bondage. Verse 8 says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved but to those that by nature are not gods. Now, as a devout Jew, Paul had always looked with horror and disgust upon pagan religions. He hated the legalism that came along with religions. He was a Jew. He was steeped in that. He was a Pharisee. He lived that life. He knew how difficult and how impossible it was to keep the law. In Acts chapter 17, when he was on Mars Hill, he spoke with scorn on the folly of idolatry. It says his spirit was provoked when he saw their idols. It stirred anger in him. He wrote passionately to the Romans about the folly of idolatry and the terrible insult that it presents to the awesome majesty of our true and living God. In Romans 1, he talks about the, how they, they worshipped the, the creation rather than the creator. Look around, folks, because you can see that today. People talk about Mother Nature. We need to be talking about Father God, uh, because Mama Nature don't exist. Uh, God sets the thermostat. In my house, my wife sets the thermostat. You thought I was going to say I did, didn't you? I don't even know how to use it. But Tina does, thankfully. God sets the thermostat for this world. 
and we can we can clutch our pearls and and and, and cry the blues about global warming i'm sorry if if god wants these oceans to rise and boil they will uh, but they're not but listen one day god's going to judge this world that's what people need to be worried about the, the fire from heaven's going to fall one day and all this is going to pass away. We don't worship the creation. We worship the creator. And around the world, temples abound. Even within Christendom, people light candles to graven images, bow down before them, venerate them, pray to them. They serve their idols with fervor and zeal, and they're held in the grip of superstition. And those who worship idols become enslaved to those idols. All right? That was their past bondage, but now he re reveals their present bondage. Verse 9, but now you have come to know God, or rather be known by God. How can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? Whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. They were drifting away from God. They were beginning to backslide. Do you know what a Christian has to do to backslide? Absolutely nothing. Even a dead fish will drift down, downstream. You don't have to do anything to be a backslider. See, these people were saved, but they were being led astray, and they were following the leading. They were abandoning the justification by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, and they were beginning to follow a pathetic path of justification by works. Now, do you know what God's remedy for backsliding is? To slide back. Come on back come back to God he's waiting read, read Luke chapter 15 about the prodigal son Jesus told that story one of the most beautiful parables in the Bible and it represents all of us that when we find ourselves in a pig pen and we realize how far we have drifted from God that we have a God who is on the lookout he's waiting for us and he's willing to run to us do you realize in the Bible many men run from God but there's never evidence that God ever ran from man God runs to man doesn't matter where you've been. doesn't matter what, you, what you've done. God says, slide back to me. In, in Genesis chapter 35, Scripture says, God said to Jacob, arise and go to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to God who appeared to you and you fled from your brother Esau. God had three words for Jacob. Back to Bethel. Because for Jacob, Bethel was a place of revelation. It was a place where he first had the vision of God. It was a place of regeneration. It was a place where he first heard the voice of God. It was a place of reservation where he first made a vow to God. Bethel was a place where God had met Jacob, where Jacob had met God, and where God had made Jacob into one of his children. Do you know why God wanted Jacob to go back to Bethel? He wanted Jacob to have his backslidden soul soaked in the healing balm of the precious memory that he had of when he first met the Lord Jesus. See, Jacob hadn't lost his salvation. He had lost the joy of his salvation because for 20 years he was spiritually unfaithful, he was spiritually unfruitful, and he was spiritually unfit because he had gotten away from Bethel. He had forgotten that the, the God that he had trusted in. Jacob had not, or he had promised God that he would come back regularly to Bethel, which means the house of God. He promised him he would return to him, but he had not kept that promise. And because of that, he had gotten into a backslidden condition. Where's your Bethel? If you're a believer here today, you have a Bethel. You have a place and a time where you came to meet Jesus Christ, where you repented of your sins, you received him as your Lord and your Savior. You need to go back to Bethel each and every single day. Listen, there's a place where we go from being a sinner to being a saint. And you may not remember the exact date or the exact time, but you will remember the exact moment. Because when you ask Jesus into your life and you repent, it changes you. It changes who you are. It starts to transform you and conform you into the image of Jesus Christ. There is a time and a place, if you're a believer, where you went from being a sinner away from God to becoming a son in the family of God. You can be diligent in your religion, and you can be distant in your relationship. You can be full of religion on the outside and empty of God on the inside. Heard about a man, he was a brand new lawyer, sitting in his brand new office on his very first day of practice. He was sitting, and he was waiting for his first client to come through the door. A man came walking through the door, and he decided he was going to look very important and very busy. He picked up his phone, and he said, well, John, 
I don't know if I can take your case right now. I'm really covered up with clients. My practice is booming. I'm having tremendous success. I'm in great demand. Call me back in a month, and I'll see if I can help you. He looked up at his visitor and said, may I help you? And the man said, not really. I'm here from the phone company, and I'm here to hook up your phone. There are a lot of people who go through the motions, the form and the function, but they have no concept of the reality of God. And Paul says to them, get back to where you once belong. You didn't know the Beatles wrote a hymn, did you? Get back, Loretta. Go back. Go back to where you met God. Do it every single day. Remember who you were before you came to Jesus in faith and look at the difference that he's made in you now. And I promise you, you will never want to return to the elementary principles of this world. Listen, there, Paul says there's two things about our worship before we came to Jesus. Number one, it's demonic. Demons know that we're built to worship and they don't care what or who we worship as long as it isn't Jesus Christ. They don't. Second, it's enslaving. Whatever we worship other than God will enslave us. And justification by works is just as demonic and enslaving as idol worship. Paul says, how can you turn back to the weak and the worthless elementary principles of the world? This world has nothing to offer a child of God. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not the Father, but is of the world. They had left their first love. They were backsliding. Again, the Galatians were not in, in in danger of losing their salvation, but they were going to be trapped in a life of discouragement, defeat, and disappointment. Ask yourself, is there ever a time when you love Jesus more than you do today? When you were more excited about Jesus than you are today? The time when you were closer to the Lord than you are right now? You may be in the process of backsliding. If you're not as close to God as you have been at some point in your life, you may be drifting away from God. James 4, 8 says, if you draw near to God... God will draw near to you. Paul wants them to go back to when they were first saved and get right with the God that they were devoted to. So we remember our stage of devotion. Second, we have to remember the stage of decision. Paul reminds these Galatians how he became like them in order to lead them to Christ. Verse 12, brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. Now, Paul put all these things aside in order to show that salvation was not dependent upon certain elements. He, he, he was a Jew, but he was a Christian. And he came to show them that they didn't need to add the law and all the other rituals and rules and calendars and dates and festivals. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And he was hammering that point with them. And he's pleading with them. Stop living like you need to do something to be saved. Paul says, I became like you. What he's saying is, I became flexible. I became adaptable. He spoke the truth in love, but he never changed who he was. When he says, I became like you, that does not mean Paul became a sinner like them. Paul already was a sinner. He wants them to become like him. You see, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, to the Jews, I became a Jew. To the Greeks, I became a Greek. To those outside, I became as one outside. To those inside, I became as one inside. To the weak, I became weak. I became all things to all, that by all means I may win some to Christ. What Paul's saying is he got into people's heads. He got into their hearts. He listened to their questions. He was feeling what their feelings were. He learned to feel, and he adapted to their problems and their issues and their needs and their difficulties. He became like one of them, and he wants them to become like him now. Now, we know as we read the book of, of Galatians that Paul is unyielding, inflexible, and hard-nosed when it comes to the gospel. But he would still shake hands with a sinner. He would still sit down and eat a meal with a drunkard because that's what Jesus Christ did. Jesus had his harshest rebukes for the religious elite. What Jesus tells a sinner is, I'll forgive you. Go sin no more. Leave your life of sin and come to me. Paul wants them to do the same. Verse 13, he says, For you knew it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. Now, he, he pleads with them based upon their previous affection for him. 
He refers to the fellowship that they had enjoyed when he first came to them in Acts 13 and 14. It talks about Paul's first missionary journey when he comes into Galatia. Now, when he was with them, he had gotten sick. And, and you can read a mountain of commentaries about what Paul's ailment was. Quite frankly, nobody knows what it was because it's not listed. Because Paul never made much of himself. Paul doesn't tell a whole lot of details about woe is me. We don't know if he had malaria. We don't know if he had an eye problem. We don't know what it was. 2 Corinthians 12, he talks about the thorn in his flesh. And I'm glad that Paul doesn't uh, tell us exactly what the problem is because we can, all, uh, we can all align ourselves with it because we all have struggles, we all have issues, we all have thorns in our flesh. Now, we know because Paul wasn't married, it wasn't his mother-in-law. That was a little break for you, by the way. But he came in, and, and his sickness was not scorned by them. They didn't despise him. Oftentimes, when somebody was sick, they were a, a drain. They were a blight on people. And they would say, unclean, get out of here. Go away. Uh, but they didn't treat him like that. Not because Paul was such a great guy, but because Paul brought the liberating, freeing message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they loved him for that. Uh, I said a minute ago, go back to your Bethel. The person that led you to Jesus that day that you came to your Bethel, I bet you still love them. I bet you still appreciate them. I hope you want to be like them in sharing the gospel. Friends, people are dying and going to hell every single day. If the living knew what the dead know, the whole world would come to Jesus Christ. Amen. It's our job to tell them. It is our job. We are custodians of the gospel. These jars of clay, we have this wonderful treasure, and we need to get out, and we need to tell other people about it. Verse 15, Paul says, What has become of your blessedness? For if I testify to you, if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? He wants to know why they no longer receive him with joy. At one time, they appreciated him so much. Now, he uses hyperbole. He's, he's, he's obviously exaggerating to make a point that they would have gouged their eyes out for him. Uh, he's probably saying something like we would say is, you would have given me the shirt off your back. They would have done anything for Paul. Uh, they, they received him joyously. They received his message joyfully. And now they're rejecting him because the Judaizers had convinced them that Paul was not a legitimate apostle and that his gospel, excluding the law, was deficient. You see, these false teachers are apostates. They're, they're, they're snakes in the grass is what they are. Jude talks about them. The only thing that an apostate can bring is the drought of doubt. And that's it. And that's satanic. An apostate has no confidence in the word of God and no message from the word of God. I heard a story about a man who hadn't been to church in a while. A pastor saw him walking down the street. said, Sam, I haven't seen you in church for a while. Sam said, well, you know, pastor, the last several Sundays it's been raining. He said, well, you know, it's dry down there at the church. The man said, I know. That's another reason I don't come. Because today, there are a lot of dry pastors feeding sawdust sermons to hungry hearts and thirsty lips. People are hungry, and they need the bread of life that's found in the Son of God. They're thirsty, and they need the living water that flows from the Spirit of God. They're lost, and they need the salvation that the true gospel brings in the Word of God. And many people are not getting any of those things. They dry up because of the drought of doubt. And that's what the Judaizers are doing in Galatia. Rather than embrace Paul, they had shunned him, and they're treating him like an enemy because he preached to them the truth of grace. And it broke Paul's heart. Now, this passage, as I read this this week, I actually said to somebody, hey, pray for me, uh, because I'm in the middle of, of Galatians chapter 4, and this is a tough one. And, and, and listen, when you rely on yourself, it's tough. When you rely on the Spirit of God, he starts to reveal things to you. And I think I have shed more tears this week reading this because it brought back a flood of, of emotional struggles that I have had as a pastor. Even as a Christian before I became a pastor, I have, I have sat with people, I have mentored people, I have done my best to help raise them up. One young man in particular, and I will not mention his name, about 20 years ago, uh, I met him here at the church. We went into a, a faith evangelism class. One of the, the things that they taught us was you got to pair up in pairs, and you got to go out, and you got to share the gospel. So him and I became partners. He was a couple years younger than me. I poured my life into this guy. All right, 
Woe is me. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. I, I tried to mentor this man. I tried to disciple this man. I watched him lead people to Jesus. Overjoyed. Overjoyed. I got home from church one day, and I received a phone call from one of the, one of the ministers, and he said, did you hear about blank today? And I said, no. He's having an affair. And he said, will you confront him with me? I said, pal, either you'll go with me or I'll go alone. Because I wanted to biblically restore my brother, despite his sin. For six days, I felt like we were on stakeout. We were looking for this guy. We were going to find him. Eventually, on the sixth day, we found him. We, we pulled in, pl- blocked his car in, couldn't let, he couldn't get out of the driveway. Went to the door, and he said, I was expecting you guys. So we went in, talked to him, and he cried the blues, blah, 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 blah. On and on and on. Wouldn't take any responsibility for what he had done. And finally, he said, you know what? I don't feel guilty about any of this. I don't believe I ever was saved. And I said, brother, I don't believe you were either. And I wept as we talked, and I wept. He hadn't lost the joy of his salvation. He never had salvation to lose. His heart was hardened. His decision was made. He walked away from Jesus. And my heart still hurts today. So I hear what Paul is saying when you've got an entire church of people being led astray by the devil. It hurts, friends. And some of you may know this. Some of you may have a child or a friend that you have shared Jesus with, that that you have ministered with, only to watch them walk away from the faith. You cannot lose your salvation. But if you never have it, you don't have anything that you have to lose. Make sure of your calling and election. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Do not allow Satan to let your pride keep you from laying it all down to Jesus. Give it all to Christ, and don't delay. So he had reached a stage of decision. That leads us to the final stage, the stage of desertion. Verse 17, they make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. So now their motives are exposed. These people are flatterers. They are false teachers feeding on the believers and drawing them to themselves and away from the true preaching of Paul, away from the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, flattery is a form of insincerity. Everybody is susceptible to flattery. We all love to have our ego stroked, be told how wonderful we are. And I'm convinced that most adulterous affairs begin with one single flattering comment. Proverbs 29, verse 5, a man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. And that's what the Judaizers have done with these new believers. They have set a trap to take away the freedom that they have in Jesus Christ and return them to the slavery of legalism. Beware of flatterers. I will, I've said publicly many times, I don't like gossips, and I don't like gossipers. And consequently, nobody gossips with me anymore. <laughs> I got the point across, but I'm going to tell you what else I don't like. I don't like flatterers. I don't, I don't care for them. I don't care for that empty flattery, that, that empty sincerity. Beware of them. Solomon says that you're better off with a person who will criticize you than a person who will flatter you. Whoever rebukes a person will in the end gain favor rather than one who has a flattering tongue. A flatterer will pat you on the back with one hand and stab you in the back with the other. Somebody one time said a gossip will say behind your back, what they wouldn't say to your face, but a flatterer will say to your face what they would never say about you behind your back. And that is true. Flattery is insincere praise from an insincere motive. That's what the Judaizers were doing. They're proselytizing the Galatians to separate them from Paul and thereby strengthening their own cause. They wanted power. Verse 18 says, it's always good to be made much of for a good purpose and not only when I am present with you. So Paul's saying it's good to be zealous, but make sure that it's correctly directed. He commends them for their zeal, uh, but he regrets that their passion is so erroneously misplaced. Verse 19, he says, My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Again, we see the pastor's heart. Paul is probably weeping when he writes this. He wants Christ to be formed in them. You see, he he brought them to Christ. He wants them to grow in Christ. Paul is their spiritual father. But now he shifts to the metaphor of a spiritual mother. 
See, he planted the church. He, he birthed the church, and now he has to rebirth the church. And he reveals his tender love for them. Paul had agonized over them, and he implored them to become Christians. Now he's imploring them to continue in their spiritual growth. But you can't do that if you're being fed lies, and you certainly can't do that if you're believing lies. And that's why we need to get into God's word, and we need to be able to say, thus saith the Lord. So that when Satan comes to us and say, did the Lord really say that? You can say, no, he didn't. No, he didn't say that. Or yes, he did say that. And I'm going to be obedient to it. This Bible next to Jesus is your best friend. Please, I implore you, as Paul says, open your Bible every single day and read it. Don't just read a a, a a daily reminder that you get in the email. That's good that you read them. I hope you do. But you've got to get into the Word yourself. And you've got to, to talk to the Lord and let the Lord talk to you. Paul's passion is that he wants them to be conformed into the image of Christ. Friends, that is my passion for you. That's a passion for myself, for my family, and for my church family. I love you all. And that, that is not flattery. That's honest. That's sincere. I want nothing better than to see you grow in the Lord Jesus because then I will know that I am doing my job appropriately in helping you and leading you into a deeper relationship with Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. So Paul has that heart. The transformation is God's purpose for every believer as Christ lives in us and through this. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I live now, I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And Paul is absolutely perplexed by their spiritual waywardness. See, a Christian is like an airplane. An airplane is different than any other kind of transportation in the world. There's four types of transportation, plane, train, car, and boat. Now, a car, a boat, and a train can stop and go backwards. But once a plane is in the air, the only thing it can do is go upward and forward. It's the same way with Christians. Because if we don't, we're going to crash. See, Paul wants desperately for Galatians to continue going upward and forward in Christ. And friends, if you're drifting from God, if you've gotten away from God, the only way forward is backwards. You've got to get back to Bethel. You've got to get back to where you started, back to the beginning where you first met the Lord, where you first gave your heart to Jesus Christ, your life, your soul, your awe. The only remedy for backsliding is returning through repentance and rededication to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the beautiful thing is, no matter how far you've gotten away from God, you can always come home again. That old Motel 6 commercial, we'll leave the light on for you. God's left the light on for you, and he's looking for you to come back. I read a story one time about an old drunk man who got in a rowboat. He was going to cross the river one night. He picked up the oars, he began to row, and he rowed all night. But when daybreak came, not only had he not reached the other side, he found that he was just where he was when he started. He had one problem. He forgot to untie the boat. Now, there's some of you here today, and you're tied to old habits, desires, wills, cherished idols in your heart. You got to untie your boat and completely pour your heart and life out again to the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you ready to start again with the Lord? If you want to go forward with the Lord, you've got to sometimes go backwards. You've got to get back to the place where you first fell in love with Jesus, and then you've got to fall in love with Jesus all over again. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you that you are a God that leaves a light on, that you're always looking and you're always waiting for your children to return to you. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters here today who have at one time truly trusted in you. They're truly saved, but Lord, they're they're drifting away from you. They're not growing in their faith. Their desire that they have for spiritual things are starting to wane. And maybe their, their faith is simply come, becoming a, a, a ritual, a, a religion, a thing that they do uh, because it's what they've always done. But Lord, you want a relationship with them, a living and a vibrant and a growing relationship with your kids, God. We thank you that you're a forgiving God. And that no matter what we do, no matter how far we go, you're always waiting with open arms. God, I pray for those here today who don't know you as Savior. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will do right now what only he can do, that he would convict those hearts that are far from you and drive them to the cross where they will find forgiveness, where they will find cleansing, 
where they will find Jesus. Lord, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do today and in the days ahead as your word's gone forth. We praise you and we love you and we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you and you'd like to ask Jesus to forgive you, but the Bible says he is faithful and just, heaven is simply a prayer away. Repent. Turn from your sins and turn to the Savior. He will give you that cleansing that nothing else can. I told the boys this morning up in the baptistry, I said, this is Harford County tap water. The only thing that washes away our sins is the blessed and precious blood of Jesus Christ. And when you come to him in repentance and faith, he will cleanse you whiter than snow. Maybe you need to be baptized like Jeffrey and Michael this morning. I'll be baptizing you in a couple weeks. We would love for you to make that, that, that obedient step and show others that you belong to Jesus. Maybe you need somebody to pray with you today. Maybe you'd like to join our church. Whatever your need, please come as the Spirit moves you.